Hello, welcome. Uh, this is Alex Ineco from Brasilia, Brazil, and uh, we're starting a lecture on romantic music, music from the romantic period, basically the 19th century. And uh, hope uh, you enjoy, hope you're, you're fine. Uh, glad to have you with us. So, um, I always like to start my, my lectures with uh, music history with this chart. It's the main art movements and uh, medieval music, which was basically a thousand years of uh, Gregorian chant. I'm exaggerating, okay, but this is more or less what it was uh, stylistically, okay. Then we have the Renaissance, Br uh, Brazil, Americas were discovered during the Renaissance, okay. Uh, the Baroque period, which starts with the invention of opera and it ends with the death of Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, the classical period, which starts with the death of Johann Sebastian Bach and the French Revolution interrupts it, okay? So we're not exactly sure when it ends, but we say 1810 more or less, okay? But that's, that's what it is. Then we have the Romantic period, which is what we're gonna talk today. Uh, and it is the 19th century, basically. And next week, we'll talk about the modern period. Okay? Good to have you with us. Um, I always like to start uh, showing some art because it's uh, some, some paintings, because it's a good way for you to understand, to locate, uh, to compare the music that we're going to hear with uh the the works uh with the, the paintings that we have so observe this um this is called the nightmare um and it shows basically there's a demon there on top of this very chaste and pure lady um and she's having this nightmare okay this is all about the romantic period. Tragedy, tragic. Hello, Marile, good to have you with us. Uh, the romantic period is very tragic. Then, look at this. Um, this is Liberty Leads the, the People. I'm not sure in the translation in, in, in English, but I think that's what it is. It's a, it's a painting by Delacroix. And if you look at it, you see many elements. There's the Bastille in the back. There's this kid with a gun in front. There's obviously Lady Liberty with uh, the, the French flag. It's a gorgeous painting. And um, this is what the Romantic period is also about. It, lots of information, lots of contrast, lots of emotions, okay? Look at this last painting here. It's just a, a, a landscape, but observe how, how, uh, how you feel, it's, it's heavy. There's this red uh, um, area here, which is kind of, you don't know if it's, a, if it's a fire or something, but you know that something is not going very well here, okay? It's not, it's not the, the peaceful painting of a landscape in the classical period, it's a, it's a heavy painting, okay? This is what the Romantic period is about. The Romantic period li loves the night and doesn't like the day. It prefers the moon to the sun. It prefers sad to happy, okay? The Romantic period, very tragic. Everything is very tragic. <clears throat> A few characteristics of the Romantic period. In arts architecture, uh, emotion, okay? So you have the books are very heavy emotion. The paintings are very emotional. Um, yesterday was better. Okay, this is very Brazilian. Okay, we think, oh my God, my grandma used to do that pasta that I love so much. When my grandma died, the pasta died with her. This is very romantic. Okay, very romantic. So yesterday was better. Um, it defies the classical rigor. It defies the classical rigor. So it says, no more rigor. I, I want to. I want freedom. I want to. I want to break free. Very romantic. Okay. And in music, emotions. Once again, new tonalities and new forms. New tonalities. It means until the classical period, 
we only had a, a handful of, uh, of tonalities, C major, D major, major, minor, uh, B, uh, B flat, uh, E flat. They were favorite uh, tonalities. In the Romantic period, there's not such a thing as favorite tonalities. You can write in any tonality. And that makes the lives of, of some musicians very hard for violin players. For, for some players, it's very hard to play in some keys. For us singers, not a big deal, but for some players, it, it really makes their lives very complicated, okay? And this is only possible with, with the brass, for example, because we have new instruments that brass is trumpets, trombones, tuba, French horns. We have now new techniques, that uh, new, the valves, that makes it possible for those instruments to play, to play in any key, okay? So you know, we have new forms, we have through composed forms, you don't have to uh, respect any specific form. Hello, Luciana, good to have you with us. Hello, Adalberto. And then uh, extra musical images, too. Extra musical images. You say the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. Oh, moonlight. Oh, remember the moon, it's so sad. And therefore, we have this sonata. Let's see. If we're, do you, I'm sure you know the sonata. War. Moonlight Sonata. <laughs> Etc. I have to stop because of uh, copyright reasons, okay? Um, but this is uh, the Romantic period. It's very tragic. It's very sad. Even love has, has this there's a little bit of tragedy in it. Remember Romeo and Juliet? It's very romantic because everybody dies, okay? It's not the love part that interests the romantic people. It's the death part. It's the tragic part. That's what is really interesting. The, the third movement of the Moonlight Sonata, for example, look at, look at what Beethoven does with the piano. Etc. I have to stop it soon because of uh, copyright reasons. Hello, Michelle, Michael. Um, now, Beethoven is this uh, incredible composer, Ludwig van Beethoven, 1770, 1827, Ludwig van Beethoven. Beethoven is this incredible composer. He is in between the classical and the romantic periods, okay? Uh, and he composes both as a classical composer and as a romantic composer. It's very interesting. You, uh, the Moonlight Sonata is in the middle of this, this thing, okay? The Ninth Symphony is obviously a romantic piece. The First and Second and Third Symphonies are classical, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, I, sp I said a little bit about uh, Romeo and Juliet being one of the favorites of, uh, of the romantic period. Romeo and Juliet was written there, in the back, in the, between the Renaissance and the Baroque, uh, by William Shakespeare, uh, English uh, writer. So why is it a favorite of Romanticism in the 19th century? Because Romantics love to bring back old stuff, okay? Uh, Felix Mendelssohn, who was a German composer of the Romantic period, loved Johann Sebastian Bach who was a German composer of the Baroque period. Mendelssohn brought Bach back to uh, be fashionable, okay? So this is a, remember, the, the Romantic period always looks back and, oh, yesterday was much better, okay? Now, I, I said, a little, I said uh, Romeo and Juliet because we have Charles Gounod, which in Brazil we know uh, uh, Gounod because of the Ave Maria, Ave Maria at 6 p.m. on the radio, okay? And um, this is Charles Gounod, who wrote the melody of the Ave Maria on a prelude by Johann Sebastian Bach. He stole the prelude from the well-tempered clavier and wrote the, the melody to the Ave Maria on top of this prelude. It's a, it's a composition exercise. Very interesting, very interesting, very romantic, stealing music. Now, Gounod wrote Romeo and Juliet, an opera. Listen to this. (laughs) 
je veux vivre. And then that's Bidu Sayal, Brazilian singer, famous in the 20th century in New York, in the Met. Um, and you can hear her sing Romeo and Juliet on YouTube. Bidu Sayal, S-A-Y-A-O, Sayal, okay? Bidu Sayal. Uh, and she is phenomenal. So Romeo and Juliet, let me put the end of this aria where Juliet is very happy and she um, she just wants to scream. Romantic. It's very romantic, okay? And then the audience applauds and throws flowers and throws money. Speaking about money, if you feel like donating something, you can always go to ikai.com.br and t click on Donate to Ikai. Thank you very much. You're very kind. So, Guno, we talked about Beethoven, we talked about Guno. And one interesting thing about the, the Romantic period is that it doesn't matter... Um, how many composers I choose, you will always have um, people who will say, oh my God, you haven't chosen enough composers. I, you forgot Brahms. You forgot those, uh, the other composers. That's the problem with the romantic composers. Everybody's favorites are, I mean, there's so many and I can't make a list with everybody. Okay, so I apologize about that. And... Uh, essa aula está acontecendo em inglês, a aula em português aconteceu antes e estará no YouTube daqui a pouquinho, ok? So this class, mas fica com a gente, this class is in English, ok? So we talked about Beethoven, we talked about Gounod, we talked about Berlioz, no we didn't, we're going to talk about Berlioz. Let me, let me write, let me play for you a little bit of the fantastic symphony, the Symphonie Fantastique. Uh, listen to this at uh, 1.36, oops, just a second. Very romantic, very heroic, Big orchestra, lots of instruments, okay? So this is a romantic period. The bigger the orchestra, the better, okay? So Berlioz wrote the Symphonie Fantastique, the fantastic symphony in five movements. Why five? Were there three movements? Well, this is the romantic period. If I want to write a symphony in eight movements, I can do it because I can, because that's the romantic period. I can do whatever I want, okay? So no more uh, formal rigor, okay? <clears throat> Now, I talked about uh, Romeo and Juliet. We already uh, heard uh, Bidou Sayon singing Jul Julieta, okay, in uh, Romeo and Juliet. Um, now, Tchaikovsky, our favorite Russian composer, And why, 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 why do I chose these nationalities? Don't ask me, okay? This is just the way it is. Beethoven was German, Gounod and Berlioz French, and uh, Tchaikovsky was Russian. And French and Russian music are more similar than you think. Lots of ballet music, uh, <coughs> the romantic music is very similar. Okay, well, I, please, okay, uh, go with me in, in that one. Um, and um, here, There's an overture called Romeo and Juliet Overture by Tchaikovsky. What is an overture? Is it an overture to an orchestra? Is it an overture to a concert? No, it's just an overture, an overture to nothing, okay? Uh, in the Romantic period, they like to name pieces uh, with uh, uh, curious names. So there is, you know, uh, uh, Hungarian Rhapsody. What's a rhapsody? It's nothing, but it, you know, they, they want to use it. Uh, great fantasy on this or that. Okay, it's just a name. Capriccio. It doesn't mean anything specifically. There's no, what is a capriccio? It, it doesn't have a form. It doesn't have a number. Nothing. Okay, it's just a, 
funny names, curious names that they, they like to use. So Overture, Romeo and Juliet, obviously based on the on the, the play by Tchaiko by <laughs> um, William Shakespeare. Okay, Tchaikovsky loves it too. Uh, and here we are going to 12.30. Listen to this. 12.30, 12.30. Just a second, I'm getting there. You know this, you like this. I promise, I promise. Oh my God, I love this. No. <laughs> oh, Julieta, why? Why? Okay. If you can, uh, if you can ask why, why during the music, normally it will be in the romantic period. Okay. <laughs> why, Julieta? Okay. <laughs> Coronavirus. Anyway. So, Tchaikovsky. What is, what is the most famous ballet by Tchaikovsky? What is the most famous ballet of Tchaikovsky? Swan Lake! Ah! <laughs> See? Every time you can do these scenes and pretend like you're Tom Hanks in that scene of Philadelphia and roll on the floor, Every time you can do this, uh, I bet it will be romantic music, okay? Music from the romantic period, okay? Now, what is the main Italian, Italian? What is the main Italian composer of the romantic period? Well, there's many, but uh, this one. Go, my thoughts, over these mountains. Go to my homeland. Okay, very romantic. You miss something, you miss someone. That's romantic. Okay, the life. This pandemia, okay, this is so... Is it pandemia? Did you say pandemic thing? Whatever. Okay, so everybody in their homes. Um, and uh, this is very romantic. Some of us are gonna die. Maybe it's me, maybe it's you. It's very romantic, okay? Uh, that's, that's the way life goes. That's the way life goes. Another of um, Verdi's operas. So this is the Duke of Mantua, and he's saying this or that one, this woman or that woman, it doesn't matter. I wanna, I want, well, I wanna take them all to my gardens <laughs> and have a talk with them. Questo quella per me sono Anyway, any woman for me is good enough. So this is the villain. The Duke of Mantua is the villain of the story, and. Um, this is terrible. And uh, he is supposed to be the hero, but no, he's anti-hero. He wants to sleep in every woman in his kingdom, in his little dukedom. And uh, duket? Dukedom? I don't know. And, um, well, in his court there is this uh, jester, and his name is Rigoletto. And uh, Rigoletto has a daughter who he's hiding, whom, whom he's hiding from everybody, especially from the Duke, because he knows the Duke will take her to his gardens. <laughs> and then, but it doesn't matter, because the Duke is powerful, and he finds his daughter, and he takes her to his gardens. <laughs> but Rigoletto finds it, and he, in this aria, he is very angry. Cortigiani vil razza danata. Oh, you courtesans, you suck! <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. 
Anyway, he's very angry. Anger is very romantic. It's formed from the romantic period. Okay? What else did Verdi write? Oh, oh! This is the Brindisi from Traviata, the toast. Everybody knows this. You can go and listen, listen to it on YouTube. Anyway, this is also very romantic and very pandemic because you no know, a toast only with a lot of booze you can survive this pandemic, I'm telling you. And then Verdi wrote you know, a lot of operas, but there's one interesting uh, work that Verdi wrote called The Requiem, okay? What is a requiem? It's a, um, a mass for the dead. Okay, it's a funeral mass. And uh, one of the movements of the Requiem is the Sanctus, which is the shortest. Uh, I think it's seven movements in the Verdi Requiem. And uh, Sanctus is the shortest. And it's very funny because it's not in the kind of a Requiem mood. It's very upbeat. It kind of breaks the other movement, kind of breaks the, the uh, atmosphere of the other movements, kind of to wake the audience up. Actually, if you want to listen to the Dies Irae conducted by me, it's there on YouTube. Click on the video, it's probably on the side here, and uh, you, you'll find you can hear it, okay? Uh, it's kind of good, it's kind of good. Uh, and this is the Sanctus. Here, listen to this. Etc. Et but you hear it's very lively, it's very upbeat, amazing. Okay, so we have uh, some other composers. Verdi, as, as we said, 1813-1901, a composer of the 19th century. Okay, then Paganini, Niccolo Paganini, Italian composer and violinist. He was so good uh, that he. Actually, he was not only good in playing, but he was good in selling himself, Paganini. He told people that he had an association with the devil. Yeah, there you go. So romantic. He said, I am good like this because the devil uh, kind of sponsors me. And believe it or not, that sold a lot of tickets. Uh, and um, the way Paganini composed is incredible because he, he uh, wrote music that was so difficult that not many people could play at the time, okay? Uh, listen to this. My, so this is part of the romantic movement, okay? Lots of notes, lots of notes. The highest you can play, the better. The loudest you can play, the better. The fastest you can play, the better. So, and Paganini was was uh, definitely in in that uh, mood, okay? Who else? Well, there's this Polish piano composer. <laughs> He totally understood the middle class. He composed for us, for the middle class. Okay, some of the ladies watching us now, uh, they would love to have Chopin over at their homes to play for the friends while they're serving tea, okay? Or fancy booze, okay? Um, Chopin completely understood the mechanics of making money out of the middle class. And uh, many, many other composers understood that too. Now, remember in the beginning, uh, until the classical period, no nobility and the church uh, was paying, they were paying for, for musicians' uh, wages. Now, the nobility lost their heads and the church lost a lot of power and money. So 
the real money is with the bourgeoisie. And um, so this is why music in the Romantic sounds so appealing to the middle class, because it needed to be, the middle class needed to be brought to the theater. And you only can bring people to the theater if you make exciting music, loud music, fast, kind of circus music. And that's what Paganini, for example, that we just heard is, okay? Uh, Chopin. Yes, the funeral march is by Chopin. Okay. Again, this fixation with death is not mine. Okay, I don't like death. I'm playing a character today for the Romantic period. Romantics love death. Life is about death. Everything, okay, the best thing that can happen to a human being is death. Okay, and that's what the Romantic period thinks. They're always afraid of death. Everything is, is around death. Love, but love as death. Oh my. Okay. The Revolutionary Etude by Chopin. Revolutionary Etude, okay? Go listen to it. It's really amazing. Once again, they're uh, exploring the instrument to its maximum, okay? So it's like you have to, uh, you, the, the, the highest and the lowest notes you, you play in, the, in the, the piano, the better, okay? So this is what Chopin and his friend Franz Liszt are about, okay? Chopin was Pol Polish. Uh, and um, Liszt was Hungarian, and they lived in Paris. Why did they live in Paris? Because everybody wanted to live in Paris. Paris was like the New York of the 19th century. If you can make it there, you'll make it anywhere. It was Paris, okay? It was Paris from the 17th to the 19th century, okay? Everybody wants to go there, and these two guys did. And these two guys understood very well the middle class. They sold a lot of... Uh, tickets to the middle class, okay? They, uh, the middle class paid to have music written for them, okay? Oh, to the marchioness of something like that, okay? And Liszt um, wrote in, uh, very difficult music. Hard, hard to play, very difficult, okay? Very difficult music. This is what Liszt is about, okay? Um, but also Liszt wrote very uh, sweet music. Listen to this. This is Liberace playing Liszt in the 20th century. Liberace was kind of an exacerbation of the Romantic period. It's the Romantic period on acid, okay? <clears throat> and um, this piece is called Liebestraum, uh, Dream of Love, okay, or something like that. And um, here we end our, our uh, class, but before before we, we, we finish, because I wanted to give you an idea of the sound of the music in the Romantic period. I hope I, I gave you that. But before I finish, I want to play you some Beethoven. Remember that we started with Beethoven? Where's my... Where's my... Oh, it's here. Remember that I started with Beethoven, 1770, 1827. Beethoven is the late classical to, into the early uh, Romantic. Now, one of, in his last pieces. Beethoven wrote a music that was considered weird or advanced to his time. And uh, there's some piano sonatas, very, very hard to, to 
not only to play but to listen to, especially if you consider uh, period uh, people in the, in the 19th century. But listen to this string quartet by Beethoven, written in 1826, one year before he died. <laughs> It's not the prettiest thing on earth. It's not supposed to be pretty, okay? Some say, oh, Beethoven was deaf and he was, uh, he couldn't, uh, he was sad and angry, so he wrote this because he wanted to annoy the audience. No, that's not true. It's very advanced harmony. Uh, it, uh, so it was written almost 200 years ago, and we still study it as advanced harmony. It's amazing. It's a fugue. Go listen to it. It's called... Uh, the gross, the great fugue, um, and uh, it's the string quartet number three by Beethoven. Okay, string quartet number thirteen by Beethoven. Type it there on YouTube, and, and you'll find it. Okay, let's listen to the beginning of it again. <laughs> to listen to. It's, it's a long string quartet, it's almost an hour long, and it's uh, fascinating. It's really, really fascinating. Well, kids, this is it for today. This was a, a class on uh, romantic music. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, remember that you can always go to ekai.com.br and find our programming there. Okay, it's all there, ekai.com.br. Click on Programação and you'll find our programming there, okay, with times, everything we're doing on the web or, and, and live. And um, I hope you guys are doing okay. Tomorrow on Instagram, we start a, a series of interviews. So tomorrow I have uh, Pedro Cardoso, harpsichord. On Tuesday, Marcos Cohen, clarinet. On Wednesday, I have, uh, sorry, on Tuesday, Pedro. On, on Wednesday, Marcos Cohen. On Thursday, uh, Tomas Bertoni from Scalene, the band, the rock band. And on Friday, I have Veronica, the singer, okay, Argentinian singer who lives in Brasil. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the class and I will see you soon, okay? Take care, stay healthy, wash your hands. I love you. Bye bye. <laughs>